Hi, my name is Shen Huang, and I am a participant at the Summer Academy here in Orpheus Institute in Ghent. Um, for my individual artistic research project, I deal with Robert Schumann and his, what we can learn about his performance practice through the hands of Clara Schumann, the pianist and the pedagogue. Now, we are really lucky to have a lot of documentation of what Clara Schumann actually said in her lessons and the different types of themes that she dealt with because she left behind many, many excellent students and pianists her, herself. Um, these kind of documents range from letters um, that were exchanged between the student and their teacher, memoirs, and journal articles, and even um, radio interviews that they conducted later in the century. Um, especially important and really interesting, I find, are the recordings left behind by her students. Fanny Davis, Adelina De Lora, Carl Friedberg, for, for example. Um, and even though these recordings were left, um, some of these recordings were, I mean, all of them were made after the death of Clara Schumann, I believe that they are a remnant uh, and they give us an insight into what Clara Schumann may have found to be good piano playing. Here are two aspects that Clara Schumann seems to discuss um, in her lessons. The first one deals with notational fidelity and the second deals with interpretation of the score. For instance, in um, a 1925 edition of Music and Letters, Fanny Davis, one of her students, criticizes the modern editor for changing the slur marking. Now, the, I'll demonstrate this on the piano. The first is um, what the editor changed, and the second is what I will restore what Schumann wrote. Now this may seem very small and insignificant, but what Fanny Davis says is that by changing the slur marking, we are changing the meaning of the text, meaning of the music. And what she writes is, she says, this is clearly denotes Floristan in an exuberant vein when he was fond of leaping into the air as Beethoven when in an extra happy and joyous mood is said to have stood on his head. Now all this may appear to be a very small matter, but the one phrasing is most commonplace, the other most uncommon. The second main aspect that Clara Schumann discusses with her student deals with the interpretation of the score. Now, um, I found one example in Theodor Müller-Reuter's book, Bilder und Klänge des Friedens from 1919, where he discusses how he was taught to interpret Einsamen Blumen in Schumann's Waldzenen, Opus 82. He writes, one can easily tread on the solitary flower to death. This will most certainly happen should the quavers in the melody be played strictly in time. One should slightly linger on the first two quavers which, then get, which can then be followed by flowing up the next two lightly into the next measure. A zufälliges, unintentional arpeggio upon every entrance of the second voice is recommended, as is a slight accelerando in the fifth and sixth measure, followed by a holding back, a ricciardando in measure seven. Treat the following measures likewise, as if the solitary flower sways back and forth by a tender breeze. So I will demonstrate this piece and play it also two times. The first without keeping the quavers equally, and the second abiding to what Theodor Müller-Reuter writes is an appropriate way to deliver this section.
Examples such as these give us insight into the past, straight into the studio of Clara Schumann. And as pianist of the 21st century, I believe that we can really learn a thing or two about the interpretation of Robert Schumann's music through the testimony of, her, of Clara Schumann's students. <laughs>